Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, or prayed to himself. Both can apply there. God, I thank you that I am not like all other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. People were also bringing, I'm not going to say the next word because it's a mistranslation, it says babies to Jesus, but actually Jesus talked to them, so I'm going to read what it should be. People were also bringing infants to Jesus to have him touch them. And when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. And Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be turned over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. Most of Jesus' teaching was as he walked, as he traveled. And that's how they learned so much from him. I tried the same when I took a group of church members to Israel. And as we walked all around Israel, I talked and preached to them, as it were. And one church member said, David, we've learned more from you in eight days here than in six months at home. I don't know how that was, but I was able to point to things. We watched the shepherds separating the sheep from the goats and putting the sheep in the sheepfold at night and leaving the goats out in the dark. And you just had to point that to them and they understood what Jesus meant. Now, there are two parables he told as they walked up to Jerusalem. And there were two people he met. And I focused on those two parables and the two people. And then we have that little bit in between where he talked about little children and also the other bit where he talked about what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And it's all getting a bit dark. There are shadows beginning to fall across the whole situation. He's still preaching. He's still healing. But somehow, already the shadow of the cross is looming over the whole story. Now let's look at the two parables which he addressed to the disciples. And these weren't told to hide anything from anyone. He was using them as illustrations to the disciples. And both were about prayer, which in its simplest form is talking to God. 
And the two parables tell the disciples first how to get through to God with something that he seems not to be interested in. And the second parable, which is one of my favorites, is about the kind of prayer that God hears and the kind of prayer he doesn't hear. And we need to know all this. It will affect us in our praying. The first parable is of the persistent widow. And her prayer was to a judge asking for justice. Obviously, something unfair had happened to her, and she appealed to this judge to vindicate her and do justice for her. She had been treated badly. Unfortunately, she went to a bad judge and were told only two things about that judge. He didn't believe in God, and he couldn't care about people. What a judge! But then he got the position, and so she asked him, grant me justice against an adversary, defend me against this neighbor who's doing her harm. And he seemed quite indifferent. He didn't fear God and he didn't care for people. However, she knew the secret of getting what she's asking for. And the secret was to bother him so much that he would get tired of her. And Jesus said, don't give up praying for something because you don't seem to be getting an answer. Go on bothering God until he does it for you. But the difference is that you're dealing with a very different judge. God is a just judge. The judge on earth was reluctant to hear her prayer. God in heaven is ready to hear our prayer. The big difference there. Nevertheless, Jesus is really saying, keep bothering God. And he will give you your justice. Now the early Christians found themselves praying for justice because the world was treating them so unjustly. And there seemed no end to their suffering. We know from the book of Revelation that Christians were crying out, God, how long? Are you going to let this go on? It's unfair. Just because we're Christians, we're being persecuted. Now this applies to Christians in most of the world at the moment who are crying out to God for justice because they're persecuted and it's unfair and it shouldn't happen. And so all of the world at this very day, Christians are crying out, God, are you just going to let this happen? You can imagine the Jews in the Holocaust We're praying to God for justice. And so there's a difference between the human judge and his reluctance and a heavenly judge and his readiness. Because the heavenly judge is ready to give us justice and will do so. But there's still the lesson to go on asking until you get what you're asking for. It's so easy to give up. And people tell me, I prayed to God for this and it didn't happen, so I gave up. And they maybe only prayed once. But Jesus says, go on, go on. My children at one stage in their childhood said, we want bicycles. Everybody at school has a bicycle and we don't. They didn't ask once. They asked (laughs) almost every day. And they wore me down. And we got them bicycles. After telling them now to be very careful on the main road. Don't take any risks because it's very dangerous. 
Same with God. If you want justice from God, keep on asking until you get it. And he is more ready than any earthly judge to give it. Life is unfair. That's the underlying assumption. All people will experience the unfairness of life. In fact, our children learn very early to say, it's not fair. And their faces used to screw up. And uh, you've heard children say that. It's tragic. There are some people go right through life saying that. And I get adults telling me, why should God let this happen? And why, why does God do this to me? And it's not fair. But keep on, said Jesus. Don't give up. Because you've got a judge who is really on your side. If we only ask for something from God once, I would question whether we really want it. It's those who go on asking who get through and they don't give up. So that's the first parable he told to the disciples as they walked up to Jerusalem. The second parable is also about prayer and it's a contrast between two people who went to the temple in Jerusalem to pray. But though they were both in the same building, there was a stark contrast between those two. One was a Pharisee, a good man, a religious man, a man who'd really tried his best to be what God wanted him to be. And the other was a tax collector. Now we read that and we think of the inland revenue straight away. But a tax collector in those days was virtually in the protection racket. He was collecting tax for the Romans, the occupying power. And he wasn't paid to do that. The Romans said to a Jewish tax collector, this is what we want from you. Every month we need so many shekels from you. And everything you can squeeze out of people above that is yours. And so you can imagine that these Jews who virtually sold their souls to be a tax collector were squeezing people hard and were threatening them if they didn't pay up. It's a horrible thing. And when I was in Warsaw going through the... Uh, Jewish ghetto remains they told me exactly that happened in Warsaw during the war the Jews were squeezed into a very small area of Warsaw into the ghetto walls were built to keep them in and then the Germans needed money to pay their army and they got these Jewish tax collectors to collect the money from the Jews for their army. You can imagine how popular a tax collector was when he was lining his own pockets and getting very rich and squeezing people by threatening them with Roman punishment or German punishment in the case of Warsaw. They were traitors to their people. They were lining their own pockets at the cost of their own people. And they were raking it in. You can imagine how popular they would be. And this other man who goes into the temple to pray is a tax collector. Horrid man. Everybody hated the tax collectors. Zacchaeus was one such man. And Zacchaeus was charging people four times too much for the Roman taxes. And uh, he admitted that. 
Well, there were the two men. And one man was heard by God and the other man wasn't. And it's the opposite of who we might think. The Pharisee went right up to the front of the temple and stood in front of God and said, God, I thank you that I am not as other people, robbers, murderers, adulterers, even like that man at the back. I thank you I'm not like him. And did you notice one word that he used five times? Which meant that his prayer got no higher than the ceiling. I thank you that I am not like everybody else. I give tithes. I fast twice in the week. I, 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 five times. And Jesus said he prayed thus with himself or to himself a prayer that's full of I doesn't get up to heaven God doesn't listen to that kind of prayer I, I, I the man in the back was quite different it was a me prayer and he said God be merciful to me I'm a sinner, I've been living a wrong life, I've been deceiving my fellow Jews, I've been raking in money by telling lies to them about what they should pay. And he knew it. And it's interesting that the first parable of the persistent widow was asking for justice. But here this man is asking for mercy. And since God is full of mercy, he is a merciful God, if you want to get through to God, appeal to his mercy. Now I've uh, listened to hundreds of prayers and attended many prayer meetings, but I have rarely heard a Christian pray for mercy. Isn't that strange? when that will get the prayer straight through to God. It's one prayer that he's bound to answer. He, he just can't help it. He's so full of mercy. If somebody asks him for mercy, he immediately answers that prayer. But why do so few Christians pray for mercy? I've heard prayers for health and wealth and happiness. I've heard prayers for safety, prayers for healing, prayers for all kinds of things that problems we have. And many people bring those problems to God. But they rarely ask for mercy. Now why not? The church teaches us to in its ritual and that's the only time that I've heard Christians pray for mercy. Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. That's in the prayer book. And uh, after the confession prayer of sin, the preacher usually prays a prayer of, for mercy. But apart from the official prayer book, it's rare for a Christian to ask for mercy and I want to tell you why. It's because you don't ask for mercy unless you don't believe you, res you deserve anything. To ask for mercy is saying I don't deserve anything from you Lord. And only people who are desperate who know they're so bad that they don't deserve a thing, they will pray for mercy. And that opens up the heavens straight away. And this tax collector, with all his badness, with all his deception, with all his sin, simply said, God, be merciful to me. 
And Jesus said, God heard his prayer and not the other man's. And I'd just like to imagine the tax collector going home and his wife saying to him, well, have you had a good day at the tax office? I haven't been at the tax office. Oh, where have you been? I've been in the temple. You? In the temple? You've not been to the synagogue since I knew you. And what were you doing in the temple? Taxing the priests? No. I was praying. You were praying? What were you praying for? He said, I was praying for mercy. And I can imagine her saying, Oh, you think he upstairs would hear that? He did. And life's going to be very different now. What a shock for his wife. It says he went home justified in God's sight. This is a most wicked man who goes home justified. And life was going to be very different. Now, I never read this story without thinking of one of my heroes. Here he is. His name is Henry Gerke. That's a photograph of him. And he's been one of my heroes for nearly 50 years. I heard about him first 50 years ago, but I noticed to my excitement that his life story was published two years ago and I grabbed it and read it. It's one of the most thrilling stories of today. At the end of World War II, 21 Nazis were arrested and charged with the solemn crime of killing six million Jews and many other thousands of people. And they were taken to Nuremberg prison where a trial was held after the war. I'm sure some of you would remember that trial in Nuremberg. And when I went to that city, I first of all visited the astonishing buildings that Adolf Hitler had erected for his own worship. Interesting that Hitler was prophet in uh, Munich, priest in Nuremberg, and king in Berlin. He was Satan's imitation of those three people. But in Nuremberg he built vast arenas where Thousands of troops, said Heil Hitler, and paraded before him. And he had one place in Nuremberg, which you can see today, which is clearly a Greek temple. And he would walk right up the aisle into this temple with thousands of his troops marching and watching. And there he was the priest of God. I mustn't go into all of the story, but I have to tell you that 21 of Hitler's henchmen were arrested and put in prison in Nuremberg. And I did go to that prison to see where it all happened. And they were tried. There's a picture on the cover of the Nazi criminals and their guards where the trial took place. It was amazing. Each of them was offered two things free of charge. One was a lawyer to defend them, and the other was a chaplain to look after their souls. Now then came the big problem. Who could they find to be a chaplain to them? And they found an American army captain who was a chaplain 
whose grandparents had emigrated to America from Germany, and he spoke German. And he was then the chaplain to a military hospital just up the road from here, near Newbury, at a place called Hermitage, just northeast of Newbury. And they went to him and said, would you come to Nuremberg and look after the souls of 21 Nazi war criminals? He was a Lutheran, having been German. And at first he was very reluctant. How can you expect me to look after the souls of men like that? They're so guilty. But God persuaded him to go. And when he arrived, I, I have somewhere his, the first account I ever read of Padre Garakia. And when he arrived there, he found that of the 21, 15 were Protestant background and six were Catholic. And so they had a Catholic chaplain to look after them. But he, being Lutheran, looked after the 15. He looked after Keitel, von Ribbentrop, Ryder, Dernitz, von Neurath, Speer, Schacht, Frick, Funk, Fritsch, Saukel and Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe. And on the first Sunday he stood up and faced those men and thought, what can I say to them? And the Holy Spirit whispered to him, just tell them the gospel. And so he told those 15 Nazi war criminals that Jesus died for them and shed his blood for them. He was a bit surprised. Saukel was the first to open his heart to the gospel. He was the father of ten children and had a Christian wife. And he knelt down on the floor and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's the prayer that God can hear. Then Fritsch, von Schirach and Speer took communion and found the same salvation. Ryder, the chief of the German navy, began to read his Bible. Keitel, and I want you to notice this, the chief of the German army came to him and thanked him so much for bringing such good news to him. With von Ribbentrop, I found no response at first. But later on, he began to read the Bible. The three who did not respond were Goering. And Goering was to commit suicide. And the other one with him committed suicide years later in a Berlin prison. One after another came to the Lord and said, God, be merciful to me. And God was merciful. And they were forgiven and found salvation. It's an amazing story. The book of his life is called Mission at Nuremberg. And that's what he did. I told this story to the church in Guildford. And after the service, an architect came with tears streaming down his cheeks and he said, I was in Germany, part of the occupying British army during the time of that trial. And he said, some of us who were Christians spent a whole night in prayer begging God to have mercy on the criminals. And he said, till tonight... I have never heard that our prayer was answered. And he said, now you tell me that most of them came to Christ through Padre Garakay. I was speaking in a house 
in Newbury to a house group and I told this story there and a young couple burst into tears and were laughing and crying at the same time. I thought they'd lost control of themselves and I stopped speaking and said to the couple, can we pray for you? And they said, no, carry on. I said, well, look, you can go into the next room with my wife and she will help you. No, they said, carry on, carry on. And as I carried on, they just wept and laughed. And afterwards, I went straight to them and said, tell me, why were you so almost hysterical when I told that story? And the wife said this, she said, Keitel, the chief of the army, was my uncle. And wherever we've gone in this world and they've found out that Keitel was my uncle, they will have nothing more to do with me. She said, we, to get away from it, we emigrated to Australia. They found out and they made our life a misery. She said, we went from there to Canada, and they found out. And we've come here to live in Newbury, and the people here have found out. And they say, you're Keitel's niece. And she said, now you tell me this story, I can lift my head up. She said, a cloud has rolled away from my life. She said, now when anybody points to me and says, you're Keitel's niece, I will say, yes, and he's in heaven with Jesus. Will you be? And she said, it just the whole situation has become different. Well, I just mention all this because this makes that parable so real. As soon as a Nazi criminal who's responsible for killing so many people says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. God hears that prayer and answers it. Even von Ribbentrop, who was in charge of Hitler's propaganda and who would spread Hitler's lies on the principle that the bigger the lie, the more the people believe it. And when he mounted the scaffold to be hung, he said, I trust in the redeeming blood of Jesus. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but I've had people resent deeply telling that story because they can't cope with God's mercy when it's offered to people like that. And especially people who say, here am I and I've lived a good life and I've done my best and I've gone to church. And yet it seems as if God in his mercy went straight to those dreadful men and saved them. It's always an offense to those who think they do deserve something when they hear that God does something for those who don't deserve a thing. Goering, I'll just mention it, because Goering's wife was a Christian. Goering's little daughter came to him in prison and said, Daddy, please trust Jesus. I want to see you in heaven. And he pushed her out of the cell and said, She believes in her way and I believe in mine. And it was shortly after that that he swallowed a secretly hidden capsule of poison and committed suicide. That whole story is the most amazing story. And when I first heard it in 1960-something, I just couldn't cope. <laughs> it was such an amazing example of the grace of God. Jesus, having told them how to pray and the kind of prayer that gets straight through, took a little child 
and gave them an object lesson with the child. Fathers, not mothers, fathers had brought their children to be blessed by Jesus. And the disciples took a very adult position and said, he hasn't time for little children. Adults were after. And Jesus was very cross. And he called the little children to him, sat one on his knee and said, unless you become like a little child, you don't get into the kingdom. He meant by a little child, not an innocent, because little children are not very innocent. He meant that kind of trusting attitude. If you treat little children rightly, they will trust you and obey you. And unless we become like a little child, to our Heavenly Father, we're not going to get in. Let's move on quickly to the two people he met on his way to Jerusalem. First the rich ruler, and the rich ruler stopped him in the street and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question. People rarely ask it because it's about the next world and the next life. And there are people today rarely asking how they can be good for the next life. I was invited to speak at the Stock Exchange and I went to the Stock Exchange in London. They asked me for my subject before I went to advertise it. And I gave them this. You can't take it with you, and if you could, it would burn. And they didn't like that subject at all and refused to take it. So I changed it to how to invest your money beyond the grave. And they did advertise that. And all the stockbrokers and stuff, it was quite an ominous crowd. But I spoke to them all on that subject and told them what Jesus said about investing your money beyond the grave. Because all of them were investing it in the life before death. How to retire to a nice bungalow and how to have plenty of income before you die. But Jesus talked about how to have income after you die and how to ensure that you'll be rich in the next world. And there will be many surprises. Well, this rich young ruler came. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' immediate reaction, why did you call me good? Now, what he was really saying, he said there is no one good but God. And he was testing the man to see if he was really recognizing that Jesus was God. And it was a lesson. We have spoiled the word good. We say, did you have a good holiday? Have you had a good meal? We even say, good dog. And we've robbed this word good of its real meaning. When you say goodbye to someone, you're saying, God be with ye. But we've robbed these words of their significance. And the word good we applied to anything, the weather, anything that we enjoy, we call good. And it's the wrong use of the word. We do use it of people. He was a good man, or she was a good woman. But in fact, Jesus was right in saying, you shouldn't call anyone good except God. He's the only really good person in the whole universe. Everybody else is capable of doing good things and being good in some ways. But none of us is good through and through. Why do you call me good? Do you recognize that I'm God or? 
it was a review. And then Jesus said, you know what you ought to do? Don't steal, don't kill, don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. He was running through the commandments. And this dear man said, I've done all those since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and said, just one thing lacking from your life. And then he told him four things that he should have done. <laughs> Go and sell all your possessions. Give the proceeds to the poor. And then come, follow me. That's all. And it says the poor man looked very sad because he had great possessions. It wasn't that he had great possessions. The possessions possessed him and he could never let them go. I think of a famous man, maybe you'll remember his name, but I can't. He had an art gallery and had collected wonderful paintings from around the world. And he was walking through his own art gallery and looking at the pictures. And somebody heard him saying to the pictures, you make it so hard to die. He was getting possessed by his possessions. Sell them all. Give to the poor. And then come and follow me. And he went away sad. His possessions possessed him. And then Jesus said, it's very hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. That's a startling thing to say, because by Jesus' standards, most of us are rich. When you think of what we have, in comparison to Jesus' day, we're among the rich. Trouble is, we think of rich people like Paul Getty. Now, he was rich. By comparison, I'm not. That's how we think. But by comparison with Jesus' day, we are all rich. Just to afford to be here in this house, we need it to be rich. And it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom. Why? Because somehow rich people can buy anything they need. And it's very difficult for them to come and say, God, Without you and without your mercy, I'm nothing. Hard for rich people to admit they need something when they're used to buying everything they need. And I have to confess, I'm rich and I can pay money for everything I need. I can go for a haircut down that way, to the Coropolis that way, to the bank that way within walking distance. I don't need anything because I can pay for it. Hard for rich people, but not impossible. With God, all things are possible. That was his reply to saying, who then can be saved? If rich people can't enter, who can? And then Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, we need to understand the humor of Jesus. In the Middle East, every other joke is about a camel. A camel is the, the most ludicrous animal you have ever seen their way of mating is absolutely hilarious. And the, every joke in the Middle East, there'll be a camel in it somewhere. And Jesus kept talking about camels. But we miss that because a camel is not funny to us. We say a camel is a horse 
designed by a committee. Now let's get in near Western humor. You can actually get a camel through the eye of a needle. You have to grind it up very, very small. And you can get it through the needle's eye bit by bit. And it doesn't look much like a camel when it comes out the other side. I'm trying now to let you see the humor of it. Preachers for years have said there's a little gate in the wall of Jerusalem called the eye of a needle. And to get a camel through, you have to take all the baggage off it. How, any of you heard that? That's rubbish. There is no such gate in Jerusalem. But preachers have said that because we don't see the fun. We're not Middle Eastern. And so we don't laugh when a camel's mentioned. But Jesus is making a joke here. Anyway, we'll move on. And so Peter said to Jesus, We left everything we had to follow you. Rather naughty to say that. But then Jesus said, No one has lost family or brothers or money or land or anything for the sake of the kingdom who is not repaid many times over in this age and in the age to come. In other words, those who have given up anything for the sake of Jesus, they will be rewarded multi times. I can bear witness to that too. For every friend you lose, you get a dozen. Even in this world, Jesus has a way of repaying, which is lovely. Now let's look at the other man they met on the way to Jerusalem and I'll try and be very brief. A blind beggar. If you were blind in the ancient world, you had to be a beggar. There was no other way to live. You couldn't make a living. You just had to beg. And they were passing through Jericho and there was a blind beggar on the roadside and he could hear this crowd making a huge noise. And he said, what's the noise about? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing through. And the blind beggar shouted out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the people nearest to him said, shut up. He's not interested in you. Be quiet. And that made him shout even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus heard him and came and stood in front of him and said, What can I do for you? What a wonderful moment. He said, Can't you see? I can't see. I want to be able to see. And Jesus said, Look at me. You can see me now. His faith had healed him. What a moment for a blind man to see for the first time. Son of David was what he called him. And he was the son of David. But we'll see in the next study that that wasn't the whole truth. He was descended from David, but he was so much more. But that was the title of a Jewish Messiah. When the Messiah came, every Jew knew he would be related to King David. Now I've missed out verses 31 to 34, where Jesus simply says, Everything prophesied of me in the Old Testament is going to happen now. Everything. I will be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. Now that's something Christians have forgotten. 
Gentiles put Jesus on the cross. Romans. And they were not Jews. Yet for 2,000 years, the church has blamed the Jews for the death of Jesus and treated the Jews accordingly. And that has got such a deep root in Jewish hearts that they have been anti-Christian, sinner. And if you mention Christ to a Jew, the memory of the crucifixion comes up and the accusation of Christians through the centuries. We had a Jewess in our church in Guildford, Mrs. Greta Reti, and she was a little girl in Vienna, that great cultural city. And as a little girl, she would walk down the street and a church door would open and Christians poured out and the Christians would spit on her and humiliate her and that went deeply into that girl's heart and they would say you killed Jesus and that blame that has been sadly called by the church for 2000 years still sticks in Jewish gullets you killed Jesus but Jesus says here, it's the Gentiles who will do it to me. Yes, he'd be delivered to Gentiles, but we Gentiles, and I presume we're all Gentiles here, we need to remember this, the Gentiles killed Jesus. The Jews wangled it. They got it passed. But they passed Jesus to Gentiles. And it was Gentiles who killed Jesus. I just want to underline that in your minds. Because I'm sure you've almost been brought up to think Jews killed Jesus. But it was Gentiles. And he said, all that is prophesied they will do. They are going to humiliate me. They will spit on me. They will mock me. They will flog me and they'll kill me. And all those things happened. And they were all foretold centuries earlier. But then Jesus adds one thing that is also prophesied. On the third day, he'll be raised up. Now the disciples just could not grasp this. They just couldn't take it in. They couldn't think of their Jesus being spat on and flogged and mocked. And they certainly couldn't think of him being killed. And above all, they just could not grasp that death would not be the end for him, but that he would be raised up. Well, all that happened, as we know. Thank you for listening again.